We've been looking at translations of graphs and things like that. So for example, we've got our parabola. Uh, if we wanted to translate it two units to the right, one unit up, what's the new equation? So we've been doing those sorts of questions. So there's our standard parabola. And we'd say, okay, shift it two to the right, one up. We get this new parabola. So x squared, we shifted it to the right, it became x minus two all squared. We shifted it up, it became x minus two all squared plus one. There's the equation of the new curve. Okay, so what has this got to do with vectors? We basically did it via horizontal then a vertical translation. We could have achieved the same thing with just sliding it diagonally. We combine those two into one vector, which we call a displacement vector. So there's the black one. The origin simply went sliding along that black line. It has a horizontal component of two units. It has a vertical component of one unit. But you see, the beautiful thing about vectors is I can apply that to every single point, the same vector. So whilst I've got it there, I can put it there or there or there or there or there or there or there. Every single point I could do that to. And it's the same vector each time. All I'm doing is adding that vector to every single point and I get this new parabola. So it's a different way of thinking about translations. Here's a way I can write it. One way of writing vectors is what we call a column vector and that's what I'm using here. I've used capital X and capital Y so I can distinguish between the, the old curve and the new curve. So effectively what I've done is I've added two to every X value and I've added one to every Y value, which is equivalent to adding the vector to one. Okay? So that's what that's really saying. Now, if we go back to the idea of parametrics, instead of writing it as little x and little y, I could have written the equation of the parabola in para parametrics as t, t squared. So x is equal to t, y is equal to t squared. So I've just substituted the parametrics in. I can add the two vectors together. My new parabola has parametrics t plus two, t squared plus one. Well, I can now come up with a new equation by eliminating the parameter. So capital X was T plus two, rearranging that. I know the parameter is X minus two. Sub that into Y, and what do you know? We get the equation that we came up with before. Okay, I've got capital Y and capital X instead of little Y and little X, but they're just pro numerals, so that's fine. So this is the sort of idea of using vectors to solve problems. So some definitions to start off with. There's a vector PQ. As I said before, it's called a displacement vector. So when we're joining two points, in this case, P and Q, notice the arrow on the top. It tells you the direction of the vector. So P to Q. If I had put QP there, I'm talking about a different vector because the direction of the vector would be different. P is what we call the tail. So where the vector starts, we call the tail of the vector. And Q would be the head of this vector. That's where we end up. Some other notations for vectors, um, a bold pronumeral. Not a great one to use when you're handwriting your solutions, because how do you make it bold? Oh, let's color over it a bit and it makes it a bit difficult. So more commonly, you'll see it as P, but with a tilde underneath it. And so that means we're talking about the, uh, the vector P and not just the pronumeral P. There is a difference between the two. Every vector can be uniquely identified, but no longer by an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. We now talk about the length of the vector, also known as the magnitude, and the angle it makes with the horizontal. Remember when in um, coordinate geometry, you want to find the slope of a line? And you said, oh, slope was equal to tan theta, where th theta is the angle to the positive. We measure it the same way. That angle is always to the positive. Magnitude, fancy word for absolute value. It's just talking about the size. So we use those absolute value signs to represent it. So magnitude of P or magnitude of PQ, absolute value signs around it. We know we're talking about the length. We don't care about plus or minus. We just want to know how big it is. So that then brings up opposite vectors. What does the negative sign now mean? Well, it now means you've got a very similar vector, but it's going in the other direction. So PQ, that vector I'm calling P with a tilde underneath. QP would be the same interval, if you like, but the arrow would go the other way. 
So for QP, the tail is Q and the head is P instead of the other way around. They will, of course, have the same slope because they will be parallel. So vector PQ and vector QP will be parallel lines. I'm going to call them lines, but they're not complete lines, but you get what I mean. Then there's this really weird vector, the zero vector. You could write it like that, PP. So P is the head and the tail. It has no length. I think it's more commonly seen just as a, a zero with a tilde underneath. So zero vector. It's weird because it has no magnitude, but it's parallel to every single vector. It's a single point. Weird. But then the, the zero is weird anyway. It does all sorts of strange things. It doesn't come up a lot, so don't panic too much. Scalar then. Scalar is that magnitude, not worrying about the direction. So it's just a number. Do you see something like this? Lambda, see in vectors, we often use Greek letters for the, uh, the scalar. Lambda P, so lambda is a scalar, it's just some number, some multiple of the vector P. And so its length would become whatever the magnitude of P is, but times by the scalar. A position vector, that's a very specific displacement vector. The tail has to be at the origin for it to be a position vector. So how do we play with them? Addition and subtraction in vectors. You always place them head to tail. Place the head of one on the tail of the other. There's vector A, and I want to add this vector B. So how would I add them together? There's A, I add B. I just place the tail of the next one on the head of the first one. Now, the new vector will be the tail of A joined to the head of B. So I could draw this green one in, and that would represent A plus B. It's sort of like saying, it's a, how do I get to these two points? The quickest way is a straight line. So that's the sum of the two vectors. But addition is commutative, we know that. Two plus three, same as three plus two. And that still works here as well. Because imagine if I went B and then added A, all right? So B, add on A, I get the same green vector. I just did it a different order, and that's fine. Another way I could write that. PQ, so there's PQ, plus QR, so I add in QR, that becomes PR. Head minus tail, again you'll notice. R minus P. But look at the addition. It's sort of like we've squeezed them together and the common letter has disappeared because that's where we joined it. So PQ plus QR became the vector PR. How do we subtract then? Well, you can subtract by thinking of it as adding the negative vector. So multiply it by a scalar of negative one. So there's A, and I want to subtract vector B this time. So what I do is I say, well, okay, there's A. I want to subtract P. So instead, I'm going to add the negative vector. Same vector, but you'll notice the head and the tail have swapped around. So add those two together. A, now I'm adding negative B, join those two up, and we have A minus B. Note, you could draw a parallelogram. I think in physics they sometimes call it the parallelogram of forces. But look at this. That's how I did it one way, and there was A plus B another way. A plus B becomes the diagonal. The other diagonal is the A minus B. Now, it could also be B minus A, it just depends which one I've made the head and which one I've made the, the tail. So one diagonal of the, of the parallelogram will always be A plus B, the other one will be A minus B or B minus A, depending on which way you go. All right, so how do we multiply? We don't actually multiply two vectors together yet, but we multiply by scalars, so we make them bigger. So multiplying by lambda will enlarge the length of that vector. So there's A. Double the length, it becomes 2A. Halve it and put it in the opposite direction, it's now minus a half A. Notice all of them are parallel because they're just scalar multiples of the original vector. So the direction is going to stay the same. The only thing that's changing is the magnitude, the length. But let's look at a problem. Triangle ABC. See, we can now do geometry using vectors instead of geometry. 
Wow, this is still geometry. But we're told AB is going to be the vector A. AC is C. PQ are the midpoints of those two sides, or two vectors. R is a point on BC such that RC is twice the length of BR. Okay. Let's find what BC and PQ are in, in terms of those two original vectors, A and C. So the question is, how do I get from B to C? And the only vectors I know is A and C. BC will equal AC minus AB. Imagine the parallelogram drawn there. It would be the diagonal, but that would be the subtraction of the two in this case. And it's head minus tail. So I know I've got to go that way. Okay. Well, AC, I know, will be C, was defined for us. Minus AB, oh, it's the negative vector, so it'll be minus A. C minus A would be the answer for BC. PQ then, how could I construct PQ? I want to get from P to Q. Well, that would be the same as going a half of AC, because that'll get me to Q, and then a half of AB, that will get me to P, uh, but I'm subtracting in this case. So I'll get a half of C minus A. Compare the vectors BC and PQ. What do we notice? Well, they're the same, but one is a multiple of the other. We've got a scale, a multiple. So PQ is in fact a half BC. So what have we actually done? We have now proven that in geometry, and that's what this next question asks, what have we done? That if you join the midpoints of two sides in a triangle, what the line you join in will always be parallel to the third side. That's what we've done. We've shown it's a half of BC. So it's parallel to the vector BC, parallel to the third side, but its length would have been halved. So join the midpoints together. The line you create is also half. So there's a way of proving geometry using vectors rather than using all our geometry definitions and, and what have you. So express BR and RC in terms of A and C. Okay. Well, again, playing around with the diagram, I can show that well, BR would be a third of BC. Uh, BC was C minus A, so I've got a third of C minus A. RC will be two thirds, because it's the other part of that line, two thirds of BC. So it'll be two thirds C minus A. Show that AR is a third 2a plus c. AR, how do we get AR? We're playing around with the vectors. To get from A to R, I could get AB and add BR because I could push those together. The B disappears, I've got AR. Now, AB, that was A. BR, we just showed it was a third C minus A. It's just like algebra now. Uh, we end up with one third 2a plus c, and that's what they've asked me to show. All right, so there's a little introduction to vectors. Well, 8a, we'll have a go at some of those, see how we go.